Praise the Lord, from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Blessed be his holy name. Hallelujah. We magnify the name of the Lord, for he's worthy to be praised. Glory to the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. The words of the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. <clears throat> Have you ever tried the Lord and you found out that he always showed up on time in your life? He's the way maker, the truth, and the life. And there's no one like him in all the earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? But when I think of the goodness of Jesus, how God always made a way out of no way, it makes my soul rejoice just knowing that he's good. His mercy endures forever. That's an everyday promise, a covenant we have with our God, that his mercy will endure forever, every day of our lives. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let everything have breath. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. I want to start off by reading a devotion this evening. <clears throat> start off with a devotion this evening and it's from the book Jesus is Jesus calling Jesus calling the book Jesus calling it's a really good book to add to your library you can find this on christianbooks.com Jesus calling and it says enjoy peace in his presence I thank the Lord first of all <clears throat> for another opportunity to be able to come on live again to teach his word. I've been under the weather the last couple of weeks, battling with a respiratory infection and couldn't hardly talk and lost my voice. And just constantly just having um, problems with, with the issues of the respiratory. But nevertheless, as I continue to trust in God's word, he is our healer, he is our deliverer, he's our sanctifier, he's our promise to bring us through any challenge that we face in our lives. Amen. <clears throat> so in our book, it says, Stop judging and evaluating yourself, for this is not your role. Above all, stop comparing yourself with other people. This produces feelings of pride and, or inferiority, sometimes a mixture of both. I lead each of my children along a path that is uniquely tailor-made for him or her. Comparing is not only wrong, it is also meaningless. Don't look for affirmation in the wrong places, your own evaluation, or those of other people. The only source of real affirmation is my unconditional love. Many believers perceive me as an unpleasable judge, angrily searching out their faults and failures. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I died for your sins so that I might clothe you with in my garments of salvation. This is how I see you, radiant in my robe of righteousness. When I discipline you, it is never in anger or disgust. It is to prepare you for face-to-face -face fellowship with me throughout all eternity. Immerse yourself in my loving presence. Be receptive, receptive of my affirmation, which flows continually from the throne of grace. Amen. That is so beautiful. Our only affirmation we can receive is from the Lord. And he promises that as we trust in him, He's the one, the righteous judge, who sees our faults and failures and provided the remedy of redemption by closing us 
in his robe of righteousness. And that is so awesome. God bless you, Cousin Marilyn. Thank you for joining tonight. It is so wonderful to know that God loves us unconditionally and he evaluates us through himself, not based on your mistakes, not based on your shortcomings and your failures, but based on his love for all of us is how God evaluates us. And we have to see ourselves through the eyes of faith, knowing that God has an unconditional love that never changes. No matter how bad we mess up or how many mistakes we make, his love never fails. It never runs out. He never changes his mind about us. Amen. And another devotion from the book, More of You, God. More of You, God. It says, Father, today I want to thank you for keeping me. What I thought was going to take me out, you used it to lift and take me to another level. Lord, this victory is all about edifying your holy name. Yes, Father, you use it to bring me into what you have for me, my best life. Lord, I'm so sorry for being so hard-headed. I had to get my head banged around many times over and over before submitting to you. However, Lord Jesus, I hear you and I'm intensely listening. Take me to where you want me to go. Just a little higher, Father, reaching up for more of you, God. That is so beautiful. And that is so true as a child of God. Many times we get stubborn. We get prideful. We get hard-headed. And God have to let you bump your head till you realize you can't make it without him. God has a plan. He has a destiny. He has a purpose that only you can fulfill according to his will. When we learn how to submit to his lordship and his authority, he will use your trials, your troubles, your situations, everything, your circumstances to lift you up to another level in him where he take you beyond the realm of the flesh into the realm of the spirit. Only when we submit to his lordship and his authority would God do that just for you and for me because he knows our name. He knows everything about you. He called you for himself and he filled you with the Holy Spirit. So good evening. Thank you again for tuning in tonight. I'm going to try to teach this lesson. My voice still messing up a little bit, but I'm going to try to do it anyway. Because the devil is a lot. What God has called for us to do, the devil in hell can't stop us. We might get de de delayed or distracted or deterred for what God has for us to do. But we have to determine, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability as I trust in your word. And it's a guarantee God will begin to manifest his saving grace, his power in your life to bring you through every situation that you may be faced with a challenge. Also, I want to say congratulations to my uh, cousin Kenny on his church, he even got his name on the church uh, our banner now. It's wonderful. And I thank God for elevation because God has many more blessings and favor he's going to release in his life in this season as he continues to keep pursuing what God has called him to do and keep moving forward. No matter what challenges come his way, one thing I love about my cousin Kenny and Marilyn, they, they have a determination to fulfill the call of God on their lives. And no matter what comes their way, they continue to keep standing and trusting God. Even when afflictions come and trials and tests come their way, they're still standing on the word of God. And I thank God for them. So again, congratulations to you, to you both, cousin Marilyn and Kenny. God bless you. So we're going to open up with a word of prayer, and we're going to go into our lesson tonight. God bless you, Deacon Cannon. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We continue to speak healing over you as you're going through the chemo process and cancer, battling the cancer disease. God is still healing. God is still delivering. God is still strengthening. God is still empowering you to make it through as you keep your faith and your eyes on him. Amen. So, Lord God, tonight I thank you that you are the sun and shield. You give grace and glory. There's no good thing where you withhold from those who walk upright before you. Lord, tonight I thank you 
for the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, oh God, to heal us, oh God, when we find ourselves afflicted, to bring us through many trials and tests and tribulations when we find ourselves getting weak in our faith, to stretch our faith, to strengthen us, to keep trusting in your ability to carry us and lead and guide us in the path you have chosen. Lord, tonight, as we begin to go through your word, I ask that you speak by divine revelation, a rhema word that will help challenge us, provoke us, change us, cleanse us, perfect us, that our lives will be surrendered and yielded to your lordship and your authority, that you will be glorified, sanctified, exalted in our lives. And I thank you in Jesus' name for every person, God, that comes on even hear this word after the night, oh God, that this word would inspire, would edify, would build them up in their faith, oh God, to trust you all the more. And I thank you, oh God, that thou would keep us in perfect peace as our minds are stayed on thee. And we speak healing, God, Oh, all those who need your healing tonight, oh God, Deacon Cannon, Deacon Willie, Father God, we even speak healing, Pastor Terry, oh God, and Jesse, even uh, uh, Denise oh, and Deborah, Father God, we speak healing over them, God, and many others who have gone through any type of illness in this season, God, and we ask that you continue to manifest your anointing, God, to bring them through victoriously. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Our word tonight, our word tonight in the book, The Bait of Satan, the book, The Bait of Satan. We're on, we're going to start from page uh, 117. It's in, um, in the book, 117 in the book, The Bait of Satan. And in the Kindle version, you follow along in the, the um, Kindle version, the Amazon Kindle, you can find on page 102, page 102. We're going to start on, on that page where it says, um, where the scriptures Mark 11, chapter verse 24 to 26. It's one of my favorite scriptures we use each week in our church because it has a lot of power in that word and it has a lot of deliverance and strength in that word as we're trusting God to manifest his word in our lives. The devil is a lie. He cannot stop this word from manifesting in none of our lives as we trust in God's ability to keep us secure in his presence. We're going to continue to keep believing God for healing in all of our bodies because like I said, I'm, my voice is not where it needs to be completely, but yet God is still healing and still bringing me through victoriously as I trust in him. Mark 11 chapter, verse 22 to 26, and it says in verse 22, And Jesus answering and said unto them, Have faith in God. That's the key verse right there in these scriptures. Have faith in God. He didn't say have faith in the world. Didn't say have faith in your possessions. Didn't say have faith in your friends, your loved ones. Didn't say have faith in anything that you do, but in God. Because when you have faith in God, everything else will begin to realign itself with the word of God to manifest in your life. It says, for verily, verse 23, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, <clears throat> excuse me, and be thou cast into the sea. He shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith, <clears throat> excuse me, shall come to pass. Verse 24, Therefore I say unto you, what things of you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So this is something that requires of you to do. It's when you begin to pray, you see, you got to believe that what you're praying for is going to come to pass. Verse 24, Therefore I said to you, what things of you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. And that's what the word is talking about, is having a, a connection with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, that whatever you believe in God for in your life, it will manifest in your life. Because if you don't have faith to believe, what you're going to trust in? Who are you going to call on? When you find yourself in a situation that you can't handle yourself, who are you going to rely on to carry you when your strength becomes weak and your faith becomes shallow? Who are you going to trust in? Verse 25 
says, when you stand praying, forgive. If you have all against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And this is a promise that we have from our Father, that if I hold on to any form of unforgiveness, I hinder myself from the promises and the blessings and the favor God has for my life. So it's very important as a child of God to have faith in God not only that, identify what your mountain is. Whatever your struggle is in your life, that's your mountain. Whatever your issue is that you've been battling with in your life, that's your mountain. And he tells us, he says, what he said, therefore, <clears throat> I say unto you, what's the thing? He said, that what whosoever should say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shut not down his heart, but should believe those things with you say will come to pass. Why? Because you got to believe that whatever your mountain is, that God has the power by your confession, by your confession to move that mountain. God only operates <clears throat> in our lives only according to our faith. Because he says, for there I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain. So he didn't say he's going to move the mountain, but you can move the mountains by coming to agreement for what God says about you in his word. So if I don't believe what God says, then it never happened. So if I hold on to any form of unforgiveness, my mountain is not going to move. Did you catch that? If I hold on to any form of resentment, any trespass that someone has done against me or I've done against someone else, my mountain is not going to move because it only operates according to what I say when I'm walking in obedience to the word of God. If I'm not walking in obedience, how can I expect the mountain to, in my life to be removed? For the remainder of the book, I want to turn your attention to the consequence of refusing to let go of an offense and how to get free from it. Jesus meant what he said, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father have forgive your trespasses. We live in a culture, we talked about this a few weeks ago, we live in a culture where we don't always mean what we say. We talked about chastising the child. And if you tell a child not to do a certain thing and you threaten punishment is coming, but there's no action in your word, that child is not going to believe you. So a parent tells a child, if you do this or do that again, you're going to get a spanking. So if you keep telling a child you're going to get a spanking and it never happens because you never follow up with what you said you're going to do, that child's not going to believe you. So they're going to keep on being rebellious keep on getting in trouble, keep on messing up because they know there's no consequence that follows your words. So you say what you're going to do, but there's no action with your word. Faith without works is dead. So if I say I got faith in God to speak to the mountain of rebellion, that rebellious spirit in my child will not move until I come into agreement and do what God tells me to do to chastise my child in love. If I don't correct, because it says, Father chastises his children whom he loveth. And he says, no chastisement is pleasing at the time, but it says in the end it yields a peaceable fruit. Why? Because it brings obedience. Chastisement brings obedience in the heart of a rebellious child. Only when I follow suit, with, with correction in the right way, not beating the child half to death, trying to kill him, but I beat them in love to let them know, hey, this is the consequences of your action so that punishment follows. So I have to punish you so you can get the message not to keep doing the same thing you've been doing to get in trouble. I remember when I was in high school in the 10th grade, I was placed in a black history class. And I was really, I was a good child, but I was not very smart, wasn't that knowledgeable in education. So I was placed in this black history class, 
And the first day I walked in, the teacher cussed me out and told me, don't bring your son to my class, disrupting my class and causing no confusion. So sit your way down. And I got in my feelings and I said, I ain't got to be in this class. So in my mind, I'm in a conversation with myself, how I'm going to get out of this class, how I'm going to not come to this class because I don't have to take this from anybody. So the next day, I didn't come to class. I skipped class. Then the next day, skipped class. Before you know it, I skipped class 17 times. And when it came down, when the office got wind that I wasn't attending the class, they called me to the office. When I came to the office, there was a counselor in that class, I mean in the office, who knew my teacher, or knew, knew my daddy. And he knew the teacher. So he said, are you um, Pastor uh, Emery's son? I said, why? Who wants to know? And he said, that's okay. I'm going to call him right now. I said, no, don't call my dad because we're going to trouble you call my dad. So he calls my dad anyway. My dad said, when you get out of school, I'm going to get you. And all he had to say was, I'm going to get you because I knew right then and there I was going to be in trouble when I got home. So to make matters worse, I didn't go home after school. I decided to go to a friend house and run away from home. And I stayed over this friend house all day. And this was during the time of Nixon, when Nixon was uh, running for presidency. And the same day, he was being appointed the next president of the United States. It's the day I decided not to go home. So my friend, by 7 o'clock that evening, he said, I, he said, I believe your parents probably worried about you where you at. I said, no, I can't go home because I'm getting in trouble. So in my rebellious ways, I refused to call my parents. And then all of a sudden I got convicted and I called my mother. And I, and I said, Mom, I said, I'm all right. And she said, baby, where you at? And she said, you need to come home because we worried about you. So I left, went home. And when I got home, I quickly went to my room and tried to stay in the room to hide from my daddy because I knew my daddy was looking for me. I got the worst whooping ever for skipping school and lying about it. So there's consequences that follows your action. So if I tell a child not to do a certain thing and he keep do doing it, there's a consequence. God does it the same way. There's a consequence that follows our rebellious ways when we keep on resisting and opposing God, because he said it's a way of a transgressor. You go against the command of God, you're a transgressor. And the way of a transgressor is hard. So you go to page 102 in the Kindle version, which is 118 in the book, and it says, in the paragraph says, both responses send the message to the child that if you don't mean what you say, or what you say isn't true. The child learns to think that not every, th every authority figure says what, what is true. So he becomes confused when and if he should take authority figures seriously. This attitude is projected onto other areas of his life. He views his teacher, his friends, his leaders, and bosses through the same frame of reference. Why? Because you allow a rebellious child to go on in rebellion, you set him up for destruction. By the time he becomes an adult, he has accepted that this is this is this normal. So it's a normal behavior or normal response to authority figures. His conversation now consists of promises and statements in which he says things that he doesn't mean. So you teach the child, I can do the same thing throughout life as an adult. I can say things I don't mean. I can teach my children to do the same thing. So the attitude becomes messed up. Let me give you a hypothetical example of a typical conversation. Jim sees Tom, whom he knows but hasn't talked to in a while. He is in a hurry and thinks, oh no, 
I can't believe I'm running into Tom. I don't have time to talk. The two men look at each other. Jim says, praise the Lord, brother. It is good to see you. They talk a short while. Since Jim is in a hurry, he finishes by saying, we need to get together sometime for lunch. First, Jim was not excited about seeing Tom because he was in a hurry. Second, he was not thinking about the Lord and greeted Tom with praise the Lord. Third, he had no intention of following up upon on that lunch invitation. It was just a means of getting away quicker and easier, easy, easing his, in his conversation into the process. So Jim really meant nothing he said in that conversation. How many times have we done the same thing? We've seen people we haven't seen in a while, and you really don't want to have a conversation with that person, so you just say something for the moment to ease the conversation just to get past this person. But you don't mean nothing you say. So in the same attitude, you're lying to the individual, you're lying to yourself, and you're lying to God. We have to be careful how subtle the enemy uses us in a small way to bring deception, not just our lives, but the lives of somebody else. So I have to be careful when I'm talking to individuals, and I don't mean what I say. That's why I heard my mama tell us growing up, mean what you say and say what you mean. Because I say what I mean, I'm going to follow up with what I mean. I'm going to do what I mean. So don't tell somebody you're going to do something for them and you didn't have an intention of doing it. Just like someone come to you and said, you know what, the Lord told me to bless you. I'm going to send you something. And it goes on for two weeks, three weeks, a month later, two months later, you never followed your word. You just lied to the individual. And they have an expectation that you're going to do something for them out of the kindness of your heart and you've never done it. Many times we've done that. We lie to people and we lie to God, not knowing that we'll be judged by the words that we speak. Real situations like this occur every day. Today, most people don't mean a fourth of what they say. It is any wonder we have a difficult time knowing when to take a person at his or her word. <coughs> Excuse me. So because people just say things, blurt out and say things, and don't follow suit with their own words, you can't believe them. You have a, a habitual liars in the church. They lie just to, to keep on saying things that sound good and don't mean nothing they say. They can preach a good message and don't live it themselves. They can teach a good lesson and don't even follow it themselves. So I can tell you what to do but I don't have to do it because it don't apply to me. So I'm going to tell you what God says so you can live by the standards of the word, but I don't have to follow that because I don't believe in myself. And that's one thing we have to be careful of as leaders in the body of Christ. You have to live by what you preach. Practice what you preach. Don't tell somebody else how to live the way God wants you to live and you don't do it yourself because God is going to hold you accountable to the life that you live before other people and behind closed doors. But when Jesus speaks, he wants to take him seriously. We cannot view what he says the way we view the other authorities or other relationships in our lives. When he says something, he means it. He is faithful even when we are faithless. I love that point because many times we're faithless. We say we got faith in God until a test comes in our lives. We say we're trusting God until you become afflicted. We say we're trusting God until your bank account is on zero. We say we're trusting God when I don't have no money for gas in my car. So when the real test comes to see if you really got faith in God, you find out you were just saying things because it sound good. Became a clanging symbol and a sounding gong. That's why Paul says, <coughs> I can speak in tongues more than any of you and don't have love. I'm just a making noise. We have to be careful of how we begin to prosper out noises from our mouths 
because I don't believe what I'm saying. Jesus, every word he spoke, it manifested. Even when the leopards came to Jesus, 10 leopards came to Jesus, so if you will, can you make us clean? Jesus said, I'm willing. And he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, the word says, as they went, they were healed. But only one had a heart of gratitude to come back to Jesus and bow down and worship and thank him for the manifestation of healing. We have to be careful. If I say I got faith in God, when tests come in my life, <coughs> excuse me, don't allow yourself to be distracted or deterred by your situation. Too many people, as the word says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I come to tell you tonight that our strength is not small in God because we serve a big God. So if I say I got faith in God, then my works is going to match my faith. Faith without works is dead. So anything that I say I got faith in God to do, it follows with action. So if I say I got faith that God can heal me, then I'm going to do what God says, find the resources that he provided in the earth realm to gravitate to to help produce the healing in my body. I can't say I'm healed if I don't believe I'm healed. If I believe that by his stripes I'm healed already, then it's a manifestation that follows suit by me gravitating to herbal teas, eating food that brings health in my body, produces health. <coughs> so we got to continue to cause our mouths to line up with the word of God and do what God says. He walks at a level of truth and integrity that transcends, that transcends our culture or society. When Jesus said, but if you do not forgive, leave your father in heaven, forgive your trespasser, he meant it. Take it to the next step further. He does not say this just once in the gospel, but many times. <coughs> Excuse me. He was emphasizing the importance of this warning. Let's look at a few of the statements he made on different occasions. In Luke chapter 6, verse 37. So if you forgive, it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 to 15. So if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you go to St. Luke chapter 6, verse 37, we'll go there right now. St. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. And it says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Why? Because if I hold on to any form of unforgiveness, I find myself becoming judgmental of my brothers and sisters. I find myself judging people according to the standards. I don't want to be judged. But Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, Judge not lest you be judged. For the same measure that you meet, it will be measured back to you again. So if I judge you, guess what? The same judgment is going to come back on me. So I have to be careful how entertain the thought of being judge, judgmental towards anybody else. It goes and says, I wonder how many Christians would want God to forgive them in the same way they have been have forgiven those who have offended them. Yet this is exactly the way which they will be forgiven. Because forgiven, unforgiveness is so rampant in our churches, we do not want to take these words of Jesus so seriously. So, I want you to forgive me, but I don't want to forgive you. So, if I don't take the words of Jesus literally, 
how can I expect a righteous judge, the loving God, to forgive me of my trespasses if I'm holding somebody in the same requirement of unforgiveness that I've been hurt, so I'm hurting them by not letting go. One thing God pointed to me today, I was sitting here reading, and the Lord said, unforgiveness will keep you in a place of pain and hurt and unbelief. If I don't forgive, that same power holds me in bondage. But if I forgive, Forgiveness is not for the other person, but it's for me. Because I learned how to forgive my brothers, my sisters that trespasses what they've done against me. I'm taking myself out of requirements of bondage and putting it back on them. So the same judgment, I'm releasing myself from that judgment and I'm allowing them to be in the same standard of being a judgmental to themselves. Until they come to the place of asking God to forgive them of the thing that they have done towards from somebody else by not letting go. Rampart or not, truth does not change. The way we forgive, release, and restore another person is the way we will be forgiven. So if I forgive and I let go and I'm, let, I'm, I'm letting the glowing God to heal me, I show the same response to somebody else who wronged me. I heard an unusual testimony about a minister in the Philippines. Friends of mine who had known him from previous ministries showed me an article telling about his experiences. The man had resisted the call of God on his life for several years because his business success. He was making a large amount large amount of money. His disobedience eventually caught up with him and he was rushed to the hospital because of a heart failure. He died on the operating table and found himself outside the gates of heaven. When Jesus, Jesus was standing there and dealt with him about his disobedience, the man pleaded with the Lord that if he would extend his life, he would serve him. The Lord consented. Before sending him back, to his body, the Lord showed him a vision of hell. He saw his wife's mother burning in the flames of hell. He was amazed. She had said the sinner's prayer, confessed being a Christian, and had attended church. Why is she in hell? He asked the Lord. The Lord told him that she had refused to forgive a relative and therefore could not be forgiven. Isn't that something? When you stand before the Lord, just like this man, a businessman, very successful, but yet walked in disobedience and wouldn't forgive somebody who wronged him. And you find yourself standing at the beam of seat of Christ. That's the judgment seat. And you find yourself before the Lord, pleading to the Lord, Lord, give me one more chance. I know I messed up. I know I held on to unforgiveness. But God, you give me one more chance. I'm going to make things right. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you a chance. But yet he shows you of one of your close relatives who's in hell, who's pleading for mercy, but it's too late because they refuse to ask for forgiveness and forgive other people. And the Lord shows you that this would be you if you don't allow your heart to let go <coughs> of unforgiveness, wouldn't that be a shame? And you stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I preached in your name. I laid hands on the sick in your name. They got healed. I prayed for folks to be delivered. They got delivered. I prayed for many to become saved. They got born again. I, I did miracles because the anointing was upon my life to do it. But yet, I held on to unforgiveness. And its response to you is, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. 
I never knew you. Wouldn't that be a sad occasion when you stand before the Lord and the Lord says, I don't even know you because I sent the messenger in your life to preach forgiveness and you still wouldn't repent. I sent your relatives in your life to, to ask you to forgive them for something they've done to you and you wouldn't forgive them. I sent many messengers along your life's journey to provoke you to righteousness. But that one area you refuse to let go of, of unforgiveness. So depart from me, you worker of rebellion, of iniquity, of trespasses. I never knew you. There will be an awful, dreadful day. He said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many people who confess to know the Lord, but yet they refuse to live right because their hearts were still full of rebellion. They were still stubborn. They were prideful. They were arrogant. They were resisting opposing God. And God says, I tried to make things right with you, but you refuse to let my love in. You refuse to let my mercy come in to cleanse you. You refuse to let go of yourself, your self-righteousness. So because of the way you live, now here's your consequence. You will spend eternity forever in the lake of fire. What a sad occasion it would be when you stand before the Lord and the Lord said, I never knew you. We have to really pay attention, people. We got to come to the place and recognize and allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts, to show us in our hearts the errors are not right before God, where he can cleanse us, where he can purify us, he can saturate us, he can clean us up to make us righteous and holy in the presence of the Lord. Because so without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Without holiness, you can't even stand before the Lord. You can't even repent before God without holiness. Because he is the only holy and righteous judge that resides in our hearts. That gives us the access because of grace to come into the presence of a holy God. And when you recognize that without God, I can do nothing. But through Jesus Christ, my Lord... I have the right and the privilege to come boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy, grace, and help in my time of need. What a wonderful experience when you recognize that I've been blinded by my own error of my ways. And God sent someone in my life to point out my error because he said we are to reprove a sinner man of the error of his ways, that he would repent before the Lord. And God would have mercy. He would abundantly pardon and forgive them of their sinful ways and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness and spiritual growth. Forgiveness and spiritual growth. Lisa and I have also seen many examples of the trap of unforgiveness in our own ministry. When I was ministering for the first time in Indonesia, I stayed in the home of a wealthy businessman. Even though he and his family attended church and I, where I was ministering, they were not saved. During the week, I was there. His wife was saved. He was next, and then all three children. There was deliverance, and the entire atmosphere in the house was changed. Great joy filled their home. When I learned I would be returning to Indonesia, with my wife, they invited us to stay with them and offered to pay for the airline tickets for my three children and a babysitter. We arrived and ministered 10 times in their church. I preached on repentance and the presence, presence of God. We sensed his presence in the services where tears flowing and cries of deliverance throughout. The entire family was were again ministered to. The husband, mother, who lived in the same city, attended every service. She had also contributed to a large amount of money to the children's airline's tickets. Near the end of the week, this man's mother looked me straight in the eye and asked, John, 
Why have I never felt this presence of God? We had just finished breakfast and everyone else had already left the table. I have been to every services, she continued, and have listened closely to everything you said. I have come to the front repenting, yet I felt, the pres I felt not the presence of God at once. Not only that, I have never felt the presence of God at any, any other time either. I talked with her for a while and then said, let's pray for you to be filled with God's spirit. I laid hand, my hands on upon her and prayed for her to receive the Holy Spirit, but there was no sense of God present at all. Then God spoke to my spirit. She is holding to unforgiveness against her husband. Tell her to forgive him. I took her hands off. I took my hands off of her. I knew her husband was dead, but I looked at her and, I looked at her and said, the Lord showed me you are holding unforgiveness against your husband. Check this out. This is so good. Yes, I am. She agreed. But I have done my best to forgive him. Then she told me about the horrible things he had done to her. I could see why she wrestled with forgiving him. But I said to her, for you to receive God, you must forgive. And explain what Jesus taught about forgiveness. You cannot forgive him in your own strength. You must take this before God and first ask God to forgive you and then you can forgive your husband you are willing to release your husband I asked and she said and she answered and I led her to a simple prayer Father in heaven in Jesus name I ask you to, for forgiveness for holding unforgiveness against my husband Lord I, I know you I cannot forgive him in my own strength I've already failed but before you now I release my husband from my heart I forgive him no sooner as she had said those words, the tears began to flow down her cheeks. Lift up your hands and speak in, and begin speaking in tongues. I urged her. For the first time, she prayed in a beautiful heavenly language. When she had such a strong sense of the presence of the Lord at the breakfast table, that's when we were overwhelmed and awed by it. She wept for about five minutes. We talked a little while. And then I encouraged her to enjoy the presence of the Lord. She continued to worship him, and I left her alone. When the news reached her son and her daughter-in-law, they, daughter they, um, they, they were shocked. The son said he had never seen his mother cry. She, she, she herself did not remember the, first, the last time she had cried. Even when my husband died, I did not cry. In the service that night, she was baptized in water for the next three days, a glow and a sweet smile radiant her from her face. I did not remember seeing her smile before that she would not she was not forgive and there was not therefore impressed in prison. She was imprisoned by her unforgiveness. She would not forgive and therefore was imprisoned by unforgiveness. You hear that? Imprisoned. But once she had released her husband and forgave him, she received the power of the Lord in her life and became aware of his presence. That is so awesome. So unforgiveness will imprison you. And this woman was imprisoned by never forgiving her husband, her dead husband, who had hurt her for many years until the revelation came from the man of God to define what was the issue in her life that was preventing her from receiving and seeing the presence of God in her life. Are you one of those tonight who have some form of unforgiveness in your heart for someone who passed away or someone that's living in your life? Someone that you once used to be friends with once might have been married to or relationship with and you never let go of that unforgiveness, your unforgiveness hinders the flow of the anointing in your life. It hinders the blessings of God from filling your life. And God is saying tonight, if you're one of those, you need to let go of it. You need to admit it, acknowledge it, Repent of it and allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse you. And the Holy Spirit will wash you clean. He'll make your slate clean. 
as God says he's taken our sins and our unrighteousness as far as the east is from the west to remember no more. That's the love of God towards us all. When we let go of ourselves, the Holy Spirit will fill you with the love of God and the mercy of God to let go of the wrongs that people have done unto you. So we're going to end right here. Next week, we're going to talk about the unforgiving servant. The unforgiving servant on page 106 in the Kindle version. The unforgiving servant. And I tell you, as God begins to reveal this word to us, it's liberating. Only if you allow the Spirit of God, page 121 in the book, only if you allow the Spirit of God to manifest his power in your life to deliver you and set you free from the inside out. It's only when you find yourself being free from the power of the enemy that's holding you in prison to unforgiveness. So all you got to do, if you're on here tonight and you're one of those who's been victimized by the spirit of unforgiveness, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord God, to come into my heart to forgive me for holding on to unforgiveness towards anybody else or even myself. Come into my heart, remove the scars, remove the stain of unforgiveness, heal me, deliver me, and set me free. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You might be one tonight who don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The word tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. That with the mouth, confession is made, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. You can be born again. For Jesus died on the cross for your sins, my sins, sin the whole world, in order for us to be forgiven. And he died, went into the grave for three days and three nights. On the third day, he rose with re redemption, with repentance. He rose with the power to deliver and set you free for your sinful nature and give you new life that's found in knowing him. Therefore, any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So you can receive this new life tonight just by praying this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I ask you, Lord God, to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, you just got born again. You might have been a backslider. And tonight, God just restored you back to right standing, right relationship with himself. Just by you believing and receiving the prayer of salvation that brings you to a right relationship with God. That from this day forward, you can live a free life from sin and iniquity because of the love of God towards us all. But I encourage you, if you don't have a church home, you can join us if you're in the Milwaukee area, Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church, under the leadership of Pastor Cornell and Barbara Anderson. You can come to 3223 West Lloyd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Every Sunday, 11 o'clock service we have. You're welcome to join us. But I encourage you to get into a Bible-based teaching church somewhere, wherever you are, where you can learn about your new identity, learn about your relationship with Christ, learn about your walk in the Lord, and gain that strength and then through the knowledge of the Word of God to take you to the place God has for you to bring you to a place of freedom and liberty and found in knowing him. Only by faith you can receive the strength when you desire to want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Amen, amen, amen. I thank you all for tuning in tonight. I thank my pastor, my son, for coming on tonight. I pray that something has been enlightening to you to make you want to study the Word of God, to get into the place where you can begin to learn about God, power, how it operates in your life through His Word every day. If you want to sow a seed into the ministry, I thank my cousin Gail. She comes on here each week, Jacqueline Whiteside. She comes on and she sows a seed uh, sometimes twice a month for the Bible class. And I put that right back into the church when she does. But I, I encourage you to sow a seed into the ministry. It's going toward our project for the expansion of our building, even for the materials. When I buy the books, if you need a book, the bait of Satan, you don't have this book, contact me at Charles B. Emery on Facebook. And I will get you this book. The books are $10. You can get this book. And it's a very powerful book to have in your library. And it's, it's eye-opening and liberating. Only if you want to study and know what God has for you to bring you from the deadly traps of offense. So you'll see. Because the seed goes into the materials that we get for the church. Even for your life to help expand your spiritual growth. So anyone got any questions or comments tonight? Any questions? Amen. Any questions tonight? Anyone? God bless you, Rita. Thank you for joining. Hallelujah. Pastor Denise and Deborah, God bless you. So Shonda, the Michael, God bless you for tuning in tonight. My friend and the work in my building. Good to see you, young man. Auntie, Auntie Terry, God bless you. Amen. Anyone got any questions or comments? All right. If not, we're going to go ahead and close out, and we will resume next week. The Lord says the same. Keep me in your prayers because I'm still going through this process of being purged from this respiratory infection. It's trying to attack my voice constantly. The devil is a lie because I am healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. And I believe the word of God that he sent this word to heal me and deliver me from all destruction. And he's doing the same thing for you. As you believe by faith, it's already done. It's already done. You got to tell yourself it's already done. Even when you don't feel like it, you can't see it happening. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to ever happen. You keep on believing the word of God. I can keep on expressing how important it is to keep having the God kind of faith to believe that by his stripes, you are healed. And I tell you, the word of God, it shall it's not a possibility. It's not a maybe. It shall manifest in your life by faith. The God kind of faith to speak to your mountain and command your mountain to be moved. It shall manifest in your life in this season by faith. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May he lift the countenance upon you and give you peace. Until next week, in Jesus' name, shalom. Have a good night. Amen.